It's me, Goku! Hey, it's me, Goku! Hey, it's me, Goku! <laughs> I didn't think it would take me this long to upload another video, but life happens, and sometimes it happens really, really hard. I want to thank everyone for all the subs and positive comments. The Cataclysm community has always been great, but I didn't expect such a big reaction to my first video. Somehow we're still getting views after all this time, and it really wouldn't feel right to leave everything hanging. So today we're going to go out and learn how to win a fight. As you may have noticed, things look a little different. I started a new file and followed the steps from the first video, so despite a new appearance in a different world map, everything's about the same as when we left off. This probably wasn't necessary, but I want to be sure that nothing in this video was too out of date, and our last file was a few months old. This video will use the experimental release from August 4th, 2022. Having a look at our map, we can see that there's a private airport to the west and a town to the north. The airport could be interesting, but for tutorial purposes we'll be focusing on that town. Houses are some of the best places to find food and equipment in the early game. We currently lack the skills, materials, and tools to make our own gear, but there's plenty of stuff lying around in town that we can readily make use of. It's night now, which is exactly what we want. Let's use the at key to pull up our character sheet. Remember all this? No? That's okay. At character creation we took two points of strength and dexterity, which will make us a little more capable in combat. We also took the street fighting background, which gives us a couple of fighting skills that'll help us handle ourselves in the early game. We also grab the night vision trait. This isn't strictly necessary, but for this video, it's going to be a really big help. Last time, we made this makeshift crowbar. It's basically a pipe with one end hammered flat. It's actually an okay weapon, but let's review our options. We're going to press the ampersand key to open up the crafting menu, and as you can see, there are a couple of melee weapons we can make. Melee weapons are currently undergoing a number of major changes, so in this video, rather than simply telling you which weapon is best, I'll teach you how to decide that for yourself, as the weapon stats we see here today could be very different in just a couple of weeks. For melee weapons, we'll almost always be working with one of these three damage types. We don't need to worry too much about them at the moment. There are exceptions to everything here, and this is all... Subject to change. Broadly speaking, Blunt is simple and effective against most enemies and gets extra base damage from your strength. It may do reduced damage to enemies with very soft or rubbery bodies, and because it doesn't create many bleeding wounds, you might struggle to quickly take down large enemies. Cut is great against unarmored enemies, potentially dealing incredible damage on critical hits. Unfortunately, giant insects and enemies with modern or bone armor are very well protected against cut damage, though this can be offset with enough skill. Stab, also known as Pierce, trades some of Cut's super high damage potential for a bit of armor piercing ability. Stab weapons tend to be small knives that do low damage or big spears which are slow and heavy. Neither of these is a deal breaker, but you'll find fewer happy mediums with Stab than with the other two. As with Cut, Stab really rewards high skill. It may be harder to use early on. At the time of this recording, some weapons, such as axes, will do two damage types at once. However, there has been some talk about changing this. All three damage types are perfectly viable, and you don't have to completely commit to one. Because this is the very beginning of the game, most of what's available to us are simple bludgeoning tools, but we do have our pocket knife. Let's take a look at it and try to figure out what kind of weapon it is. We'll press I to access our inventory, and then E to examine the knife. Here's the melee damage. 7 pierce. That means that whenever we successfully make an attack with this weapon, we'll do 7 base damage. Enemy armor will subtract from this number, and scoring a critical hit will apply skill-based multipliers to it in that order. For reference, a basic zombie has 80 health and no armor. This is the to hit value. Weapons are awarded a bonus or penalty, usually ranging from 2 all the way down to negative 6. Combat in Cataclysm tends to work with pretty small numbers, so this negative 3 is a hefty penalty. The base moves per attack is the number here. As discussed in the previous video, the basic unit of time in Cataclysm is 1 one hundredth of a second. A basic zombie takes about 1.3 seconds to attack, so if we were standing next to one trading blows with this weapon, we could expect to attack twice as fast as the zombie, assuming we didn't have any speed penalties. Remember those? They apply to attack speed too, and enemies tend to be unaffected by them. It's something to think about. These DPS values are derived from our current skills and stats and are tested against three theoretical enemies. 
Best is a dummy that has no skills or armor. Nimble is a smoker zombie, which has no armor but high dodge skill. And Armored is against a soldier zombie, which is very well protected against blades. I am not a big fan of DPS as a measurement in this game, as there are too many factors at play in a real fight for it to really be a good metric. But you can see that, according to this at least, it would take us about 14 seconds to kill an ordinary zombie, and the game doesn't think we'd be able to hurt an armored enemy at all. Stamina usage is listed here, and it's derived from weapon weight. Lighter weapons naturally use less stamina per swing, but we must also take into account the rate at which we're swinging and the damage we're doing per swing. Hopefully, you looked at all of this and decided that the pocket knife is a terrible weapon. It is! This must be one of those really teeny tiny ones. We can do better! The most important factors for an early game weapon are a decent speed to damage ratio, blocking ability, and to hit. Those last two especially will make up for our poor skills and lack of armor. For this outing, we'll be selecting the cudgel. You can see that it boasts decent damage, great speed, a high to hit score, and it's lightweight. It also has these three special moves at the bottom. Many weapons have these moves, and they'll automatically proc as long as the conditions are right, which makes combat fast and surprisingly simple once you actually understand what's going on. Just to go over them, the cudgel has high blocking ability, which means it will intercept attacks for us, often taking durability damage in the process. It has rapid strike, which does half damage for half the move cost. This one isn't always great and can sometimes be detrimental, especially against armored enemies, but at this stage of the game it's a good thing. Lastly, we have Precise Strike, which is awesome. When we crit, we'll stun the enemy for up to 2 seconds. That move requires that we have 3 melee skill. Currently, we only have 1, but we'll get there. Overall, the cudgel is an easy weapon to craft and has been part of the go-to meta for a long time. It requires 2 fabrication, which we ground out during our last adventure, and for the cost of a plank and a few minutes of carving, we get an accurate, quick, lightweight weapon that does a broadly useful damage type. The cudgel does not hit especially hard, and it isn't durable, but it'll help us a lot in these early nights. We'll hit W to wield our cudgel, and before heading out, we're going to talk to our NPC. We'll do this by walking down to them and pressing Shift-C. You always start with an NPC in this scenario, and they always have a quest for you. These usually involve going to town, and since we're headed there anyway, we may as well try to kill two birds with one stone. We'll choose option C here to see what Lucinda has for us. Alright, we'll bring some back if we can find it. No harm in accepting the quest anyway. We did this last video, but because we're on a new file, we'll have to stop here and press the underscore key to make sure we're using the brawling martial art. We started with this martial art thanks to the rank and melee that we got from our Street Fighter background. If you don't have this, things will be a bit more difficult. If you do have it, turn it on and leave it on at all times unless you know what you're doing. Brawling is always better than no style, and it's often better than the other martial arts you can learn as it works with all weapons in every situation. This is our night vision radius. It's determined by our perception, the available light, our eye encumbrance, our visual acuity, and any night vision traits we may have, and it can be positively or negatively impacted by things like sunglasses or low light goggles. If the moon were full, we'd actually be able to see quite a distance, but it's not, so this is what we get. It doesn't look like much, but it's actually equal to what most zombies have. All creatures can see directly adjacent to themselves at all times, plus whatever their dark or light vision value is. Ordinary zombies have a night vision rating of 3, which means they can usually see about 4 tiles away from themselves in the dark. As we approach the town, we must first stop to consider our escape routes. As a human, we are stronger, faster, and smarter than a zombie, but zombies exist in great numbers and do not feel pain or fatigue. If we just try to go into town and slug it out, especially in the daylight, we would quickly get overwhelmed. So let's plan for some hit and run tactics. We have these trees here to break line of sight, plus the undergrowth to slow down pursuers. We also know that we're faster than the enemy, and since it's night, we can feel confident in our initial approach. That's the first rule of combat. Always have an escape plan, and when in doubt, always choose to run away. The zombies aren't going anywhere. You can always come back later.
And here we finally come across our first zombie. The red exclamation mark on its icon indicates that it can see us and is hostile. Since it's a zombie, that means it will stumble toward us and try to hit us, ignoring all hazards and distractions until we're dead or it loses sight of us. We could fight it here, but fighting is noisy and zombies have good ears. If the others hear a commotion, they'll come to investigate and we could quickly get swarmed. So what we're going to do is kite this guy backwards, taking care to go back the way we came. We could try going down the street and out of town, but we haven't searched that area yet and we don't know if there are any threats there. We could pick up ads moving blindly through the dark. We're faster than the zombie at a walking pace, so we'll just casually lead it over to this bushy area. If we press X to look at this tall grass over here, we can actually see that some of these tiles have an increased move cost. It's actually quite high for the grass on the right. This might give us a free strike or two, so we'll go stand on the other side of it and wait for our foe. Zombies are too stupid to avoid hazards, but because they stumble around, they'll sometimes move randomly instead of going toward us. We have to reposition a bit here to make sure we get our free hits, but we're in no danger, so that's fine. The zombie finally steps into the grass. This incurs an extra move cost for it, but it won't slow its attacks down. That means that while bushes are great for breaking up enemy formations, making an escape, or holding choke points, it's usually not worthwhile to try to kite the same enemy through them over and over again. We take a few swings, either by walking into the enemy or pressing the tab key, which will automatically attack anything in range. And right away, we're doing okay. This isn't great damage, but we can get a few hits in before the zombie can react. It does eventually get around to attacking us, though, doing a very small amount of damage to our chest. Unlike monsters, which have a single HP pool, we have separate pools for each limb, our head, and our torso. If our limbs reach 0 HP, they break. If our head or torso reach zero, we immediately die. Our strength score gives us a base HP of 90 for each limb, so this little bit of damage is nothing to worry about. We should note, however, that damage almost always comes with pain. Pain is a speed debuff, and that can get out of hand very quickly, so we must always keep an eye on it. At this stage, it's manageable. As we continue to fight, the zombie grabs us. Grabs won't stop us from fighting, but they do slow us down and prevent us from moving unless we succeed at a stat contest against the enemy. Some enemies, like zombies, gain a special bite attack while they're grappling, so it's in our best interest to resolve this situation quickly. Most of the time, the best way to deal with a grab is to quickly kill the enemy that grabbed us. Trying to break away is slow and will waste time and be attacked on failure. Since pain is constantly adding up, it's critical to ensure that we are never wasting time in melee. We also take a bleeding wound in this fight, as indicated by the combat log and this little icon. We can check on the status of this in our at menu. All limbs can bleed, and the severity ranges from inconsequential to extremely lethal. This wound is of the former type, and will close up on its own without inconveniencing us. We'll also take this opportunity to look at our speed situation. As you can see, we're at 80% of our normal speed thanks to our pain level and the fact that we're still grabbed. Back to the fight. We basically just keep hitting tab here until this zombie's dead. If we have a look at it with the X key, we can see that we're more than halfway done clubbing it to death, so let's finish the job. With that, our first enemy is defeated. We've taken some minor damage, but considering that we have minimal skills and no armor, it could have been a whole lot worse. You see that yellow icon next to the zombie? Or the fact that its name is listed in yellow text here? That means it will eventually get back up. Whatever force is animating these zombies is capable of regenerating and reanimating them. So let's press S and smash the corpse. That will kill it for good. We won that fight, but we can do better on the next one. Let's have a look at our at menu. See our torso encumbrance? Encumbrance gives us several combat debuffs, so when we're fighting we should take off anything that isn't essential, especially bags. Let's go out to the street and put down our messenger bag. Uh oh, there's a fat zombie here. I assumed this area would be clear, but that's never a safe assumption if you haven't visually confirmed it. We can also hear other zombies in the general area. If we try to fight here, we'll get surrounded, so for now, let's use our established escape route and make sure we're fighting them one at a time. We'll press Shift Apostrophe to switch our movement style to running, then hustle back the way we came. Our walking speed is faster than a zombie, and if we just walked far enough, that'd be fine, but running here means we break line of sight sooner so we don't have to bother. We need to watch our stamina as we run, though. Many survivors have died by wasting their energy trying to run from a monster, only to have it catch up to them while they're tired and helpless. Weaving around the trees and bushes ensures that the zombies will waste time bumbling around looking for us, and that lets us get to a part of the road we've already visited. 
We want to drop our bag on the road because it'll be easy to find later. I can't tell you how many times I've set my backpack down in a house or a backyard or something and simply lost it forever. Items never despawn, but the world is huge and it's really easy to lose track of stuff. With the bag placed on the ground, we can see that our torso encumbrance is a bit lower. The emergency jacket we're wearing is still adding quite a bit, but without it we'd be taking cold penalties, so it's worth it until we find a shirt or something. Hearing so much noise while we were running from those zombies should tell us that we're likely in a pretty dense area. That means we're going to need to be very careful about pulling enemies out one by one, and we may need to go home before we actually get to explore any houses. It's so easy to get greedy at this stage, but remember, we have plenty of food and water back at home, so we are in no hurry. We check the nearby area first, sweeping out a little wider until we spot one of the zombies. We lead it back to this tall grass, and then fight it when it moves in. This time, it doesn't go quite as well. We don't take heavy damage here, but pay attention to our pain level. As soon as it hits distracting, we need to consider pulling out. We don't have anything to help us manage our pain, and now we're taking stat debuffs as well as speed. Getting hurt more, which is inevitable now that we're debuffed, is only going to push it higher. Pain is a cascading effect that requires constant management. There are, however, three houses on this southern row, and the woods present an easy way to escape if we get into trouble. Just so we don't leave empty-handed, let's try some stealth. We'll avoid or flee from any enemies we spot and try to grab any goodies from the house on the right. We'll head east, giving the section we've previously explored and filled with enemies a wide berth. We find the house, and it seems quiet. Inside, there's a fiction book on a shelf. But how do we get in? We could break a window, but that would draw attention. Let's sneak around and see if we can find an unlocked door. Success! These types of glass doors are never locked. Once inside, we find more books. The pink books are fiction and will boost our morale. The red books are skill manuals. There are cards here, too, which we could play with during our downtime. We'll grab the cards and the manuals for now. Battle Brothers! Space Marines, today the enemy is at our door. We know our duty and we will do it. And if we die this day, we die in glory. We die heroes' deaths, but we shall not die. No, it is the enemy who will taste death and defeat. We move into the dining room and spot some crackers and peanut butter, which is way better food than the protein rations. As we head over to grab them, the sound of breaking glass off to the west grabs our attention. It's likely that a zombie has caught our scent and is trying to move in our direction. We need to grab what we can and get out quickly. We hear movement just outside the kitchen. That window is closed, but unreinforced household windows don't block scent very well. If there's something out there, it's probably going to find its way in here pretty soon. We step into the bathroom and discover a treasure trove of soap and medicine, but we also get hit with a rock. This is a feral human. Ferals are humans who have succumbed to the zombie outbreak, but technically haven't died yet. They're smart enough to use basic tools and open doors, and they're much faster than most zombies. They're very dangerous at this stage of the game, especially because they can throw rocks. We can't outrun this lady, so we're going to have to close to melee as fast as we can so she can't pelt us anymore. We run up on her and beat her down before she can do too much damage. As with the zombies, we need to smash her when we're done. We'll grab her crowbar. It's a real crowbar, so unlike our makeshift one back home, it can pry open doors and windows. Ferals can have all kinds of weapons, and sometimes they even have armor. Since they're not rotting, their clothing is also clean, though it's usually damaged. Uh, they could be a great sources of gear early on. We'll grab all the good stuff while we're standing here. Alcohol wipes and pills are great early game finds. We can use these to clean wounds or treat pain. There are also asthma inhalers here. We don't have asthma, but sometimes you run into NPCs that do, and they always appreciate the help. Lastly, there's antiseptic, which is essentially a more powerful alcohol wipe. We'll cover the uses for all these medical supplies in a future video. Looking around the kitchen, we find a skillet, matches, string, batteries, a pile of steak knives, and a garbage bag. 
The bags can be used to create plastic sheets, which are surprisingly useful. I mistakenly grabbed the steak knives here, and not the chef knife. I'll have to come back for that later, so we can make a knife spear. The skillet will be a general purpose cooking tool. Bedrooms usually contain clothing, and that's what we're after now. We'll grab these jeans in case our current pair rips, and this gothic ring because it's funny. There's a cookbook and a can of cola in here, and lastly we'll check out the armoire. Boom! A sleeveless leather trench coat. A duster would have been better, particularly one with sleeves, but this is still a great day one find. We'll grab it and put it on right away. We can get rid of our emergency jacket now. Can you see me making another mistake? Yep, I left a bunch of items in the pocket of my old jacket. I'll have to go back and grab it off screen later. It's not a big deal. This kind of thing happens all the time. With that all done, we decide to head home for the night. We're a bit better equipped now, and while we could immediately take advantage of that, the safer choice is to regroup and see if we can use our new books and supplies to get us in an even better position to come back tomorrow night. The last thing we'll do is take a look at this coat we got. The armor system is very complicated, and it can be difficult to figure out just how protected you are. The first thing we can see is the coverage. The coat covers 8% of our arms and 97% of our torso. That means if an attack targets our torso, there is a 97% chance that the coat will get in the way. This is pretty good! We can see the encumbrance. 0 to 14 for the arms, and 4 to 31 for the torso. The lower value is the base, the higher value is where it maxes if you completely fill the pockets. 4 encumbrance is really good, so as long as we keep our stuff in our jeans or our messenger bags, this is going to be a really good piece of gear for fighting. You can also see the protection values for the lower and upper torso. They're actually identical, but the upper torso is slightly exposed while the lower torso is completely covered. So what do these values mean? They mean that if we are hit in the torso, then 97% of the time, the attack will have its damage reduced by the listed amount. So an attack that hit us for 6 would instead do 4.5, rounded up to 5. That's not great, but most of the hits we're taking are doing single digit damage, so over time it actually works out to be quite helpful. The coat is, of course, much more effective against bites and other cutting attacks. But what about piercing? Well, unless otherwise listed, piercing protection is 80% of cut protection, which is part of why people say stab weapons are armor piercing. The ballistic protection here typically only applies to actual guns. Other projectiles, like arrows and rocks, will use the melee types of damage. The way armor breaks down body parts like shoulders and lower torso is currently pretty unhelpful, as enemies can't actually target these areas. A zombie will never hit you in the shoulder, so this 40% shoulder coverage is meaningless. It's just where the game derives its 8% arm coverage after looking at the total coverage of the garment. This may change in the future. I'm not really sure what the plan is, but for now, try not to let it confuse you too much. Lastly, we can see our pockets. This is nothing new if you've looked at your jeans or messenger bag, but it's a good way to check up on how full our coat is, just so we don't lose track. That's going to do it for the basic introduction to combat. Hopefully you now know how to do basic night raids, how to deal with a couple of the more common early game enemies, how to retreat, and how to evaluate gear. Next time, we'll look at reach weapons, early game ranged attacks, blocking, dodging, and martial arts. We'll also go over encumbrance and how to fight in the daylight. I want to thank everybody again for all the kind words and support that the videos had, and hopefully it won't be quite as long before I see you the next time. Let's all try to stay alive until then.